A lady was having a dream one night that she was taken by an angel to tour a new world. And on the first stop, they came upon a large group of, tab of people and they were sitting at a table that was filled with the most delicious, delightful looking gourmet food. The only problem was that the forks were so huge that the people were having difficulty figuring out how to eat the food. And so they looked drawn and meager and weak and as if they were dying. The angel took the lady to another place and there was the same setting, the same amount of people at the large table with lots of gourmet food and huge forks. But the difference was that these people seemed well fed, they were happy, they looked so pleasant. So the lady asked the question, what is the difference between the two groups? They, so many things are the same, and yet one is dying and the other one is thriving. And the angel said, on the first group, the ambassadors who were sent to teach them how to use the forks got distracted and caught up in the beauty and the delight of the gourmet food and sat down to feed themselves and discovered that they couldn't and fell into the same trap as those who sat at the table, and they are dying. But the other group, the ambassadors, when they went, they taught the people how to eat. And in teaching them how to feed each other with the big forks, they were fed, and so not only did they thrive, but all the people around them began to thrive. Like the people at the table in the first stop in this woman's dream. Believers in Jesus Christ seem to be, seem to be more and more every day spiritually hungry, emaciated. And the reason is because the disciples of Jesus Christ who were sent to feed them, to teach them how to eat, became distracted about feeding themselves and became so selfish so that they became unprepared to really teach the people how to eat. We find a tremendous lesson in the Word of God according to the familiar story of the feeding of the 5,000 that I'd like to share with you this morning to empower you so that you will never be like those disciples and those ambassadors who get distracted with their own eating and their own satisfaction rather than first feeding the people. If you will open your Bibles with me to the story of feeding the 5,000, the one that is told in the book of Matthew. This story was so significant, so important, that it's recorded in all four Gospels. It's in Matthew chapter 14, Mark chapter 6, Luke chapter 9, and John chapter 6. And although my focus is on Matthew's version of this story, we will draw lessons from all four Gospels. I chose Matthew's version because Matthew's Gospel really relates to the multitudes. Across the pages of Matthew's Gospel, you will find the homeless, the hungry, the restless. And so Matthew's version appeals to me because the young people in our church and in our world are more like the people that are described in the Gospel of Matthew. They are homeless, looking for a home with Jesus Christ. They're hungry, wanting to be fed with the bread of life. And they're restless. They're young and restless. And we know the place where they can find rest, not just for today, but for all eternity. The story is so familiar that I would not read it 
before I do some exposition of the passage. So let's begin in Matthew chapter 14, verse 13. And I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. Now when Jesus heard about John, you remember John, his cousin, who was his forerunner, was viciously murdered by Herod. And no one came to tell Jesus until about five days after John was buried, the disciples of John came to tell Jesus. And imagine what it must have been like for Jesus to hear that his cousin had been murdered and he was close by within a day's journey and he wasn't told so that he could be there at the graveside to say his final words about John, the same John of whom he said, among all of those who are born of a woman, there is none greater than John. And so Jesus was really hurt by this loss and hurt by the fact that he wasn't able to be by the graveside of John. But he was also mindful of the fact that this same Herod would play a part in his own cruel crucifixion. And so he took himself, he withdrew from where he was in his hometown in Nazareth, and he took a boat to a secluded place for himself where he could grieve, where he could grieve like Jewish men in his day, where he could fall on his face on the ground and beat the ground, and he could cry out without the hearing of other human beings, cursed be the womb that brought me into the world, like Jeremiah or one of those other prophets would say. And when the people heard of this, they followed him on foot from the cities. They followed him on foot from the cities and you can imagine what they looked like. And Mark said that when Jesus saw them, they looked like sheep without a shepherd. I want you to keep that phrase in mind because Mark is telling us something important. They looked like sheep without a shepherd. You know, a few years ago, when I visited New Zealand for the first time, my dear friend, Pastor Kanji, brought me to New Zealand for the first time. And I discovered that there were 7 million sheep to 4 million people. When I, when I rode into town and looked on the mountains and saw it was all white, beige, white like snow, and I asked, does it snow here? And they said, no, it's sheep. I, it was amazing to me. I saw brown sheep, black sheep, white sheep, beige sheep, every kind of sheep. And I learned something that changed the way that I preach about sheep. Because I used to preach that the reason why Jesus uses sheep as, as, as a symbol of Christians is because they're so compliant and they're so nice and wonderful. Well, that's not true. I discovered in New Zealand that sheep are just like Christians. They're obstinate. They are of their own mind. They do what they want to do. And, and this is why the, the shepherd needs a rod and a staff. One day, we were driving up the mountain, and some sheep had scampered under the fence into the road. And we were told that you can't drive through them because if you hit one of them, it's a big problem in New Zealand. And so we got out of the car, and we all went, shoo, shoo. And those sheep just stood there and looked at us and <laughs> make me move. It took a long time. It was wasn't until they heard a dog barking and then they scampered under the fence so we could go on our journey. But when I saw that, I said, it began to dawn on me the references and symbols about sheep and I said to them, could you show me what it's like to have a sheep without a shepherd? And they took me to a place where there was, the ground was dry, the leaves were all gone from the trees, the place was smelly, the wa little water was dirty looking, and there was some sheep beating their heads against a tree. And I asked, why are they beating their heads against the tree? And I was told that there were bugs in their, in their wool, and since they didn't have a shepherd to take the bugs out, they would beat their heads against the tree until the bugs came out or they died, like sheep without a shepherd. 
This is how Jesus saw those people. Most of them were blind because in the days of Jesus, the people cooked over wood stove and the smoke caused their eyes to, to, to go blind. This is why Jesus healed more blind people than anyone else because they had problems with their eyesight and they did not have ophthalmologists and optometrists to care for them. So imagine what the people must have looked like blind, breaking sticks from the trees so that they could walk to where Jesus was. And when they came to where Jesus was, if you notice in the text, not one of them said to Jesus, we're sorry to hear about the loss of your cousin, which would be the nice thing to do before you ask him to give you something. But they're just like us. We often forget that Jesus is human as well as he's God. Ellen White wrote somewhere, I believe in the Desire of Ages, where she said, even to this day, Jesus waits patiently, anxiously for someone, anyone, to just come and say, I love you for no other reason than that we love him. But we always go to him for something, just like the people in his day, just like the disciples. No one paid him the compliment that he would pay forward with his own life. And so when he went ashore, he saw the large crowd and he felt compassion for them and healed their sick, verse 14. He felt compassion. I love this word, compassion. In the Greek, splanknizomai. It describes the inward parts. You know, when you're flying in an airplane and it drops, and you know your stomach goes flippy-flop? That's what the Greek words compassion describes. So when Jesus saw all these people broken, blind, and, and, and waiting for him, his, he, he went flippy-flop. His, his, his inner parts turned upside down. And when it was evening, after he spent the whole day blessing them, healing them, talking with them when it was evening the disciples came to him and said this place is desolate it's an aramone that's the greek word even the greek word sounds desolate it's dry it's a desert there are no grass no trees no water none of those kinds of things it's a desolate place and the hour is already late. So send the crowds away that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Listen, these disciples who had been with Jesus, who knew what he could do, you would think they would say, what can we do to get them some food? But instead they said, send the crowds away so that they can go in the evening when everything would be closed to buy some food. Now, why would the disciples say that? The reason is because they were covering up something that you will discover that Jesus knew, but they didn't know that Jesus knew. You see, when the disciples traveled with Jesus, they carried with them a basket. And we'll come to that basket again. It's called a coffinus, from which we get our word coffin, because it was like an accordion shape basket. It could fold up into a small thing that they could carry very easily with their little overnight things. And it could stretch into a huge thing where a fully grown person could be fit in it, in this basket that they carried. And each one of them carried one of these baskets. And whenever they were going into desert places, they would put enough food for themselves and Jesus, each one of them in their baskets. The reason being is that they did not want to have to buy from the Gentiles or buy from Jews who were not careful about how they prepared the food. And so here they were in a desert place, a desolate place, and they did not have any food in their baskets. And they didn't want Jesus to know that they were so careless that they left to come into a desert place without food. So here's what they said to Jesus. Send the people away so that they can go and buy some food for themselves. Go with me to Mark chapter 6. And look how they respond. Mark chapter 6. 
verse 37. They said, verse 36, send them away so that they may go into surrounding countryside and villages. And so Jesus answered them with a command. He said, you give them something to eat. And that's the title of my sermon this morning. You give them something to eat. It's not a request. It's a command. Jesus, knowing that they had empty baskets, commanded them so that it could be revealed to them that he knew that they had come unprepared. So listen to what they said in response. They said to Jesus, Shall we go and spend 200 denarii on bread and give them, those poor people, something to eat? It is always a fact that when disciples are distracted and indolent, they become defensive and insolent. It is always a fact. And listen to the insolence. As they spoke to Jesus, you expect us to take our money to buy food for these poor people? So let's see what Jesus did according to Matthew's telling of this story. Back to Matthew. So Jesus said to them, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. The word only really drives me crazy because these men and a few women unnamed had traveled with Jesus. They knew what Jesus could do, the miracles that he could do. And they brought to him five loaves and two fish. And they say, this is all we have, like we do you know, we come to Jesus, we believe that he is, the, he is the owner of the sheep on a thousand hills. We forget he also owns the hills. And we come and we say, all I have is this. I'm just a, I'm just a youth leader. I'm just a this. Little becomes much when we place it in the master's hand. So they said to him, this is all we have. And Jesus said to them, Bring them here to me. And then he ordered the people to sit down on the grass. Uh-oh. Wait a minute. He ordered the people to sit down. Have you ever wondered why he ordered them to sit down? Because they were poor people. They were not used to sitting down to eat. They stood and eat the little scraps of food that they had. And so he had to make them. He had to insist. He had to force them to sit down to eat. Because only rich people and princes in the days of Jesus who reclined, who sat down to eat. But listen to this. Did you notice? that he made them to sit down on grass? Grass? Didn't they say in all four Gospels that the place was an aramone, a desert, a desolate place? So where did grass come from? When you're reading the Bible, don't just pass to the next verse. This is a bump in the road that says slow down and ask some questions. So Matthew said there was grass. Let's hear what Mark has to say. Because Mark is the, is the writer of the starkness, of the immediacy. And so let's hear what Mark has to say. This is what Mark says. He command, verse 39, Mark 6 verse 39. He commanded them all to sit down by groups on what? Green grass. Mark never writes in technicolor. There is never a place where Mark says, and Jesus was wearing orange robe with blue sandals <laughs> and a little feather in his hair. No, Mark never tells us any of those details. So if Mark tells us that he's made them to sit on green grass, he's telling us something significant that we mustn't miss. You see, the people to whom Mark, Matthew, and Luke, and John wrote, they knew the Old Testament better than we do. For Mark began by saying, they look like sheep without a shepherd. What comes to your mind? 
And when he made them to sit down on green grass, what comes to your mind? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green grass. Mark was saying, the Messiah, the chief shepherd has come and he is Jesus Christ. That's why they're telling us that it was green grass. Because Isaiah testified and said, when Messiah comes, when the chief shepherd, as Peter calls him, when he comes, the desert will what? Blossom like a rose. And Mark was saying, it is happening, people. This is the one. In fact, the people got it. Even though we miss it when we read this story, the people got it. Look at John chapter 6, verse 14. Look at what it says there. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which Jesus had performed, they said, this one... Truly is the prophet who is to come into the world. This one is the Messiah. So the Messiah. They wrote this in hindsight. So let's look at the story as it unfolded. So he made them sit down on the green grass. And then he took five loaves and the two fish. And looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food and breaking the loaves, he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds. Look at what he did. He took the bread, he lifted up to heaven and he eulogized it. This is what the Greek word is, eulogeo. You means good and logeo means word. He said a good word about the bread. We don't know what that good word is. Unfortunately, we spend our time eulogizing people who are dead. Jesus eulogized when they're alive. He took the bread and he lifted it up to heaven and he said some good words about the bread. It's not like grace. It's not like he said grace. It was to bless the bread. Why? To find the answer to that, we have to look at John chapter 6. Verse 9, here's what John says. There is a lad here who has five barley loaves. Barley loaves and two fish. Barley loaves? Do you know that barley loaves were forbidden as food for human beings? The great historian Philo says that barley is only good for the consumption of the lowest animals and human beings who are in dep deprived circumstances. Barley was wheat that grew along the streets, that grew with all of the horses, manure and dust and dirt. It was the poorest of the poor person's food. In the Jewish writing, they said that barley should not be used by human beings. They can, it can only be used for the lowliest of animals. And so when they, the disciples brought the loaves to Jesus and they saw that it was barley loaves, this is why they say we only have this because it's not good for consumption. And the people knowing that it was barley loaves, if Jesus had given it to them in this setting where he had caused them to recline like princes and princesses, to be served as such, they would not have taken it. But Jesus lifted it up and said good words about that barley loaf. Oh, I'm so glad that Jesus lifted this barley loaf and said something good about it. Because I know that when I was born again and converted to Christianity, that Jesus lifted me up and said some good words about me. Because before, before I was converted, I was like the barley loaves. I grew up on the streets of sin, in the filthiness of sin. 
And I want you to know that men sat on me, women spat on me, birds pooped on me, and dogs peed on me. But Jesus Christ came and lifted me and said good words about me. And baby, look at me now. Yeah. Barley loaves. All of us. Like sheep. Like barley loaves. Have been lifted up. By Jesus Christ. But the miracle isn't over. And they all ate. They sat down, Luke said, in groups of 50. And we know that 5,000 men were served. And scholars tell us it was over 20,000 people counting the women and children. And they all ate and they were satisfied. I love the Greek language. Because the word for satisfied is not the way it's written in our English. The word for satisfied describes a cow who has eaten and is full, and then it lays down and chews the cud. They were like fat cows laying down and chewing the cud. You know what the cows do? They have two stomachs. They fill one. They lay down and they regurgitate and just make a meal of it. They were satisfied. I want you to imagine what it must have been like when they ate. They were poor people. Jesus caused them to miraculously, he created grass, green carpet for them. He forced them, he made them recline on this green carpet so that they could eat like princes and princesses. And I imagine that when the bread came around, the disciples brought the bread that they were serving them. I don't think they just took one little piece and let their pinkies hang out and munched on it. I think they took a handful, stuffed some in the folds of their garments, and then ate what they could and ate and ate. So imagine that these 20,000 people, they ate and ate and they stuffed in their garments and yet they were all satisfied, including the disciples. Sometimes when we read this, we forget that the disciples also ate that day. And so they ate, and they were satisfied. And then, after they were satisfied, they picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 full baskets. Twelve full kofinas. Not narrow, but full. Now, I don't want you to miss the miracle. And the miracle is not just that Jesus fed 20,000 people with five loaves or two fish. That's part of the miracle. The miracle is not just that the people were fed so that they were filled and satisfied that's part of the miracle. The real miracle here is the message for you as leaders of the young people who have come to this meeting to be moved with the power of God. Here's the message for you. Remember the disciples when Jesus asked them to give something, when he commanded them to give something to eat? You remember that they were nervous, they didn't want Jesus to know that their baskets were, what? Empty. But look at what happens in the end of this story. Each one, 12 baskets, you get it? Were, were filled. Now these 12 baskets were not filled with crumbs. Some versions say fragments, but it doesn't mean little bits and pieces of crumbs. It means good, broken pieces of bread. Their baskets were all filled to the brim with big pieces of bread. Well, here's the message for us this weekend and into the coming days. We may have come to this meeting with our baskets empty 
And we probably didn't want anybody to know that we had come with our baskets empty. And so we sang and we talked like we are full. But God knows that when we came into this place, we felt empty and we needed to be filled. And he's caused bread from heaven to come down and to fill not just our hearts, but you'll be able to take back with you full baskets of bread so that when you hear the command, you give them something to eat. You will not hide, but you will be able to stand up and say, I have been in the presence of God and I've got something to say. Amen. I didn't come here this few days to just relax and rest, I could do that in Michigan. I came here these few days with my basket, wanting it to be filled. And God knows it's not even over yet. And I have very little room left because I am being filled and you're being filled. And when we leave from this place, we'll have something to shout about. I don't know. Why we think that our message is to be given in quietness and silence. But I think that we've got a message that tells of the bread from heaven. The bread that is able to feed more than we can imagine. And when we leave from this place, we shouldn't be shy and silent. We should stand up and say, I know somebody. I've been with somebody. I've been with the God of creation. The one who can take five barley loaves that is not fit for human consumption and turn it into good bread. I've been with that God and I can take you to the place where you can have that good bread. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you, good bread. God bless you, good bread. God bless you, good bread. For in the beginning when he created the heavens and the earth, he looked out and he said, good bread. God bless you. Amen. Let's stand and pray. Okay, clap if you're going to clap. What's this Adventist little veggie clapping? I can't stand vegetarian clapping. I like the real stuff. Either do it or don't. Okay? I want you, when you go back to your churches, to not be afraid. Don't let the naysayers cause you to do veggie clap and veggie preaching. Veggie is only good for eating. I want you to worship God in spirit and in truth because you know without a shadow of a doubt that you, my brothers and sisters, you are good bread, not because I said so, but because God said so, and so it is. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the blessings that you've been pouring out on us. Lord, you have taken us to mountain highs after we've been through the valley of the shadow of death. And you caused us to live, to be here, to be moved with your power. Thank you for the blessings that we received from our devotion, from the blessings we received from the songs, and for the blessings that we expect to be brought to our table, the gourmet food, by our pastor who's coming after me. Thank you, Jesus, for everything. May we just praise you and thank you for making us who were born barley to be good bread. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.